Hi. So some of you might know this is my third time around the world, and um, it's sort of an interesting situation because the lessons that I've gained are not the ones that I was looking for. And it's funny how that usually, you know, tends to be the case. But in my case, it's just sort of a, a weird blend of um, history, economics, and sociology. Um, and let me just try to share with you a few quick points. Uh, number one, the post-World War II uh, aftermath uh, is responsible for most of the um, effects that we see in our lives. And, you know, that's not only if you live in Germany or, or Japan. It has to do with this idea that we are now going to enter into a security agreement that is linked to trade. And so the minute that security and trade became intertwined, um, at that point you had the genesis for um, obviously the military industrial complex. And we can fast forward to the future where the one unaccountable entity, among many others, but certainly the one that's costing uh, in the most trillions of dollars has been military expenditures uh, by quite a few countries. And this is all the way, you know, if you go back and look at the budgets, uh, you know, in the U.S., you know, they, they, they think they're spending about $660 billion in the most recent budget uh, on defense, or, and that does not include appropriations. Uh, which are off-balance sheet uh, military expenditures on war, for example, that are considered to be, you know, one-off situations or temporary situations. But of course, um, that's just not how it's actually worked out since 2001. And what you see again is that, you know, you can actually extrapolate that towards America's allies. And America's allies are even Singapore, a small, rich country. It's number one line item uh, expenditure. Uh, its most costly budget expenditure is also the military. And so it's difficult to see that um, unless you are able to travel and read and, and try to put, put these pieces together. Um, but it also explains a lot. Now, in the past, obviously, with Eisenhower and George Marshall in Japan and Germany, the idea was we we're going to trade in an effort to build up your supply chain integrity uh, and also to, you know, because you need that. You need, you need to have a supply chain, uh, in order, a good one, in order to ship products and then have this trading relationship. Uh, and, of course, the U.S. has a quite a small population worldwide. The U.S. only has about 4 to 5 percent of the world's population. So this obviously helped the United States. This idea of trade with people who are going to be on the same page as you uh, and who are going to buy your weapon systems um, and also, you know, which, by the way, also means you're uh, committing to being on a, on a certain electronic system uh, or a digital system. And you can see that falling apart even today. The French have come up with their own. They're trying to move away from Google. Uh, they've come up with their own search engine, which I think is called Quest, um, kind of a variation of Duck, uh, Duck, Duck, Go. Um, and the idea being that you know you can try to slowly move away from uh, this uh, USA platform uh, that has served the whole world f fairly well um, from 1945 until probably about um, 1991, and so you you start to see when you're in a, in a place like like Malaysia or uh, Indonesia where you have roundabouts, and you know I've been to London and I've noticed roundabouts there, and you know I've said to myself, well, why is it that we we have these, this sort of infrastructure design here and not in the U.S. or in several other places. Like, Actually, I, th I think you also have a, a lot of that in Morocco. And so once you start going around, uh, and, you, know, you start to see all these things. Uh, and they all come together because, once again, the idea would be that once you set up the supply chain, you're also in a position where you can implement uh, jobs for your own civilian infrastructure. And so this is obviously fairly obvious. Uh, when you go into the Middle East uh, and, you know, you, you essentially carve out little territories like Kuwait um, and, you know, you also make sure that you're not only dividing and conquering by splitting up, you know, ter no, um, territories, but also, uh, you know, creating a situation where they're competing with each other um, and the smaller the territory that's carved out, uh, the more, um, you know, the less power that, that entity actually has in the long run, because, of course, they, you know, they can't defend themselves against a larger enemy, especially if there's next to one that might be a potential threat. Um, and, you know, the Finns can tell you about that, the Pol Polish can tell you, the Poles can tell you about that, and so on. So, um, and again, that goes back to a lot of these other things coming together, 
in terms of the infrastructure. Now, that, that also explains why so much of the infrastructure is starting to look the same. Because, you know, when you go in and you have these trade agreements, the idea would be that you're, it's supposed to be mutually beneficial um, over the long term. And, and like I said, for the most part, it has been. The living standards have come up considerably. But upon a deeper examination, um, you know, what you really see on the civilian sector is that outside of a few cities, these so-called mega cities, infrastructure has been quite slow and disorganized. And by that, I mean, if you're in a, a second tier or a third tier city, for the most part, well, number one, you weren't affected by, by war. You know, the, when, if, you, if you have limited, limited resources and, and you, you know, you're going to bomb London, um, you're not going to try to bomb, you know, some sort of smaller city in, in the UK um, like Aberdeen. Although actually Aberdeen has, has oil, so uh, it's, it's, it, it's maybe that's a bad example. So um, it, it, again, it, it sort of creates a situation where you know you, you're trying to see all these connections coming together, and the question is, you know, why haven't these second, third, fourth tier cities been given the development that they so obviously need? And and the question and the answer to that is they have. It's just not been good development. It's been development by mall. You build a mall. And in, and in, in Southeast Asia, especially, it's not uncommon to see one mega mall. When I say mall, I think people in the West are, are might be a little uh, shocked to see just how big the malls are in, in Asia. Because there's a lot of undeveloped land here, um, and, you know, you can build massive, massive complexes um, that are, you know, that aren't just sort of, you know, a piece of suburbia. And ultimately, you know, you've got perhaps, you know, one massive, massive posh mall. Um, you know, right, may, right next to, in some cases, another massive, massive posh mall. Um, and that doesn't tend to work out very well for the people. Uh, the malls that tend to be most useful uh, and less chaotic are typically ones built by a company called Paragon. Um, and, and I don't know if that's the, it's certainly not the fanciest mall, but it seems to be the one that's most uh, useful. Um, and but that doesn't excuse the fact that you were in a position where, you know, there's really, there's no technology transfer. When you build a mall and you build food establishments, there's no technology transfer. There's no, you know, you don't have this idea of VC capital coming in. You have the idea of a lot of entrenched interests that have built a mall, the same one, in X city that are now coming to Y city. And eventually you're going to spread this out. And, you know, you have to ask yourself, well, why? How many, do you really need two malls next to each other in Jakarta? And, you know, I'm, of course, I'm speaking of the Grand Indonesia uh, Mall, which is next to another one, Thamrin, perhaps. Um, and again, they're literally next to each other. And that's one of the reasons I like Southeast Asia. I can walk. It's faster to walk than it, than it is to drive a car. Uh, and certainly public transportation in most of these cities is non-existent. Um, although you have some, you know, great, great shows of, um, of optimism in, in, in Palembang, which has its own Indonesian-made tram, um, and so it's uh, actually above the ground, it's similar to Chicago's um, train system in, in, in the sky. So you look, go back and ask yourself, you know, what's, what's, you know what, what's the next step? And the next step, obviously, is trying to figure out a way to expand capital investment, but in, in ways that, that diversify the economy. And that's certainly not happening today. And, and the thing is, it's not happening because in, in many cases, the elites... Uh, the ones who work for the UN um, and the ones who work for a lot of like the WTO and a lot of these different organizations, you know, they're, they're looking at the numbers, which they should. But the numbers should be one aspect, not the full aspect of development. And the, and the reason being is if I build a shopping mall, certainly the GDP of the economy is, it gets a massive boost. But that's only because there's been nothing there. And suddenly you have paved streets where there weren't any before. That's not how capitalism really helps because, you know, sure, you've got a bunch of people that now are making much higher wages than they otherwise would. But the real question is, you know, what do they do with that money? Are they able to invest it? And, and this, this is the biggest problem in Southeast Asia. Because of inflation, people just don't save money. Ordinary people don't save money. And so you don't have this idea of countries being able to use their citizens' um, investments, sorry, their, their, their deposits, to f create a stable banking system. And if you're not able to create a stable banking system, then, you're, then two things happen. You're dependent on foreign capital. And foreign capital is unforgiving. It will build that same shopping mall. It will come in and tell you what to do. It will build two shopping malls next to each other. Um, and it will not give you the diversified capital that you need or the, the, or the diversified number of jobs that you need. And so for the most part, you know, you've got this idea that how do you attract foreign capital in ways that are, that are sustainable? 
And if you, right now, from what I see, it's clearly not sustainable. And, you know, what you have is just debt upon debt upon debt that actually increases uh, GDP numbers. All the numbers look good um, because suddenly somebody ha now has a job in a shopping mall making far more money than they would have made um, at a food stall um, or in doing home care or in the informal economy. And so but that's not exactly something that's, that's sustainable if you don't have a similar method to allow that person to save money, buy a house, and then create essentially a banking sector uh, that spreads the wealth. And right now, in, in, in most of these countries that are so-called developing, the private sector is, is hamstrung because the banking sector is hamstrung. And that again goes back to savings and how, what do you do? That goes back to oil. If you're having to buy oil in US dollars, um, and, and then, you, then you've got a problem because it's a very strong currency. And you know, if I sell you Columbia sweatshirts and Nike shoes, um, that's fantastic. Uh, if you buy that from me, that's fantastic. But ultimately, I know that I'm going to get that money back from you uh, because oil is the number one commodity, tradable commodity in the whole world. And so I'm, it's going to come back to me in my currency uh, if, I'm, if I'm in the U.S. or anywhere else that's tied into this economic security arrangement. Uh, that would obviously mean the EU, that would mean the NATO countries, but of course that's also falling apart because Turkey is a member of NATO um, and Saudi Arabia I don't think is. Uh, and of course you see some fractures in these post-World War II alliances. Um, so that's just a small sort of, you know, looking backwards. And I'm, I'm only going backwards to 1945. A real problem seems to be that, you know, if you go all the way back to say the invention of insurance, you know, human beings have had to clump together to um, avoid or try to minimize the, uh, predict, the, the unpredictable impacts of things like sickness, of Mother Nature, of disasters, and so on. Um, and of course, since World War II, we've, we've focused on man-made um, you know, issues and, and wars and so on. But really, if you want to go even farther back, the idea has been that mankind is, is having, has never really tried to survive on his own. It's always been in groups of people clumped together, uh, trying to trade amongst themselves uh, in order to set up things like insurance so that if something does, a negative does befall the community, there's an infrastructure in place. It's, it, it wasn't called a financial infrastructure. They didn't call it, call it insurance. It was a fund, like a widow's fund. And if you, when you create those sorts of financial mechanisms, in many cases, you create a system where you want to trade with each other in your small community. And, you know, civilization has moved so far beyond that. Uh, but it's been, the question really is, has it been a debt-fueled, sustainable um, effort to go away from that small communal, um, that small communal business, um, and you know, which which was tied very closely with uh, what the society wanted, um, is, is that something that's that's you know, have we moved too far away from that? And most people would say we haven't, because you know, ultimately we have insurance for everybody now. Um, but again, if you look at the numbers, um, it's quite unsustainable. Whether it's Medicare. Uh, in, just in the U.S. or many other places that don't have a lot of oil or a lot of natural resources. Um, and the question is, where do we go from here? Uh, that's what I picked up when I traveled, um, and I don't know how that's how it's all going to work out, uh, but at least I can identify the issues. And I hope if you travel too, uh, you'll be able to, able to sort of notice patterns and also just try to figure out you know, solutions. You know, how do we get away from this? And luckily, people at the U.N. are trying to figure out ways uh, of getting there. Uh, one way is tourism. Um, but, you know, there's got to be a, a better way as well. Uh, there has to be a multi-pronged approach if we're going to try to get out of this morass um, that clearly isn't working out very well for uh, most people.